This is Marty Wilson speaking. It's uh, August 5th. I'm sitting in Monroe County Historical Association with Bill Rader. We're going to talk about uh, Mountain Spring Lake Resort. Uh, and Amy's sitting here with me and Tanya's sitting here with me. Uh, so, Bill, let's get started with where and when you were born and who your parents were. Okay, my parents were Jack Rader, Jack B. Rader Sr and Marjorie Rader. Um, they both, uh, they were both born in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, and my dad was born in 1922. Our mother was born in uh, 1927. They moved up to the Poconos permanently in 1953, I believe. Um, I was born, uh, I have four siblings, <clears throat> and um, I'm the only one that was actually born here in the Poconos. So everybody else grew up here, but I was the only one actually born here. I was born in what is now, I guess, Lehigh Valley Medical Center in East Stroudsburg. It was Pocono Hospital, East Stroudsburg Hospital back when I was born. And I was born in 1963. Do you know when or what brought your parents to the Poconos? Yeah, I do, as a matter of fact. So um, both of my parents' families had uh, a couple of different types of small businesses in the Lehigh Valley. So on my mom's side, her father was a GMC truck dealer. Um, and on my father's side, his dad was a car dealer. Uh, they had a Cadillac dealership in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and they also had a bar called the Brow House in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, back when my father was a small child, uh, my grandfather, Harold Grader, uh, brought he and uh, his friend Dick Huffert up to fish for a few days at a lake called Trout Lake, which is what I would call our, the next lake over for us in Readers, Pennsylvania, where we are. And I think he was about 12 years old at the time. And he and uh, his buddy spotted a mountain in the background. They thought they'd walk up to the top of the mountain that day. So as they, on their hike, they came across into the lake. And uh, so this would have been around 1934. And that night, uh, my grandfather drove over to see the lake. And uh, if you looked at it today, you wouldn't believe it, but um, there were really no trees on the property at that time. It was, it was farmed, there was a dairy operation. And as everybody knows, most of the lakes up here were built to harvest ice from. So Bill Costello, who owned the property, the ice company at that time, drove down and said, basically, what are you doing on my property? My grandfather introduced himself. They became friends. And uh, as we all know, the ice industry collapsed when refrigeration, commercial refrigeration became um, you know, viable. And um, in 1945, my grandfather and a few partners bought the lake. And then over time, my grandfather bought those partners out. So my father was still uh, in active service for the Second World War when he bought the property in 1945. And then in, um, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. There was just a lodge. None of the cottages were on the property at that time. <clears throat> so they didn't at this point, or did they think they were going to turn it into some kind of... They thought they were going to develop it. My grandfather, thank goodness it didn't happen. My grandfather, we still have the plot maps. He cut the whole property up. It was 450 acres at the time into quarter acre lots. And uh, my father figured out how to talk him out of that. They built the first cabin in 1954. That was cabin number three. And um, the reason I bring that up is because my parents uh, decided to build a house up here and uh, in the early 50s. And they moved up in, I think, 1953. My dad really wanted to get up here. He just loved it up here. And um, they moved up before they had any interior doors on the house. So they wanted to get up here and that's how it worked back in the day. So they moved up in the early fifties and off they went, started, you know, converting some old buildings into cottages and building log cabins and things like that. And what we have today is a Mountain Springs Lake Resort and the Lodge of Mountain Springs Lake, uh, which are run as two separate businesses, but it's, um, uh, the lodge is an event space. It used to be a restaurant, a uh, fine dining restaurant. We converted to events in early 2000 and the resort's been operating continually as a resort since 1954. So it was your dad who kind of pushed your grandfather into doing the resort? Absolutely. Right? And I know you weren't around then, but do you know anything about from family stories how they started to market it or? Yeah, it was a complete ground game. So, you know, as we all know, there was no internet in uh, the 50s, um, at least that anybody could use. And um, so it was, you know, printing, writing letters. We actually have people that have given us letters that our mother wrote to them describing the cottages. And I can tell you, even as a, as a, as a, as a child, uh, when I say, I mean like nine, 10 years old, what would happen was people didn't just decide, oh, we'll rent this place sight unseen. They would drive up uh, or dad would be in the office and, he, you know, they, 
you know, there'd be a couple, three of us hanging out in the office and we would literally ride with people. We'd take people down, let them look at the cabin they were thinking about, and they would come back up and place a deposit if they wanted to stay. Mm-hmm. And we would actually tour them. So we would, my, my parents would write letters or there would be, um, you know, very sparse or spare brochures. I brought along a rate sheet that from 1971, which is, you know, pretty far along with after they built it. But yeah, it was just pick up the phone, call people, talk to them about the place. People would drive up and decide whether or not they wanted to rent. So your parents were from the Lehigh Valley. Is that the target audience or were they sending these letters to people in New York, Philadelphia? It was really, it started out mostly Eastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, and then New York started to figure, you know, figure into the equation in the 60s. But, <clears throat> but it was, I would say to this day, it's still the same target market. So it's really the tri-state area and, in um, you know metropolitan New York, New Jersey, Eastern Pennsylvania, we get folks coming from all over the country. But I would say eighty-five to ninety percent of our business comes from there. And then we also, in that eighty-five percent, is some from uh, Delaware, you know, Washington D.C. area, Baltimore. Okay, so the the first cabin was fifty-two. You said fifty-four. Fifty-four, and you come along in sixty-three, if I remember correctly. So by the time, well, your first memories, maybe you're four years old, five years old. Yeah. What are your first memories of the resort? Um, my first memories of the resort, I'm trying to think back. There's a couple things that really strike me. So first off, there it was still fairly sparse from a tree perspective. I mean, the trees were there, but they were younger, smaller, so you could see further. Uh, we lived... Uh, on top of a hill on behind our office, which is on Mountain Springs Drive, and the trees were so spare, you could, if it was a rancher, you could just see Big Pocono from there. Today, if you go up to that house, you can't see anything because all the trees have grown. The other thing that I, um, that really sticks with me as a very young, early memories were, was the snow. Um, and I have some pictures of that too, but we lived in, as I mentioned, a ranch house and, um, our, the dogs we always, we grew up with were basset hounds, not very tall. And we have pictures of the basset hounds where we were inside the kitchen and it was not just a lot of snow, but drifting. It was cold, colder, I would say. And the, the dogs were literally staying on top of the snowbank, looking down past the gutter into our gutters, into our kitchen windows. I mean, it would just... If you didn't put up snow fence back then, which you don't see anymore in the Poconos, right. yeah. the roads were shut for the winter and it didn't necessarily melt. I mean, we would have feet of ice on the lake um, and uh, you could depend on it. You know, we used to put, take a tractor out on the lake. When I say a tractor, I'm not talking about a small tractor. I'm talking about a large, you know, farm level tractor and plow the ice so people could ice skate on the lake. So we open in the winter? Oh yeah, open year round because we're 10 minutes from Camelback. Ah, uh, so you're also sort of a place for skiers. Yeah, now. and this is random. This is before my time, but um, I'm just going to go back to how cold and consistently cold it was in the winter. Um, they used to hold car races on the lake. So people would come up from all over and these cars would have big you know, spikes or studs on the tires. And, you know, the lake is almost a mile long. So these guys would, you know, it's like a, think NASCAR-ish. Yeah. And, you know, cars would be parked, filled up the, the fields around the lake. And, um, but they would host those races. They did, I think, that three or four or five times. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what did you do as a, when did they start bringing you into the workforce, as it were? Well, I don't know if you can count me touring people through cottages on the workforce. I didn't get paid for that. So I guess it was a gratis position. Um, I got voluntold that I was gonna do that, just like we all did. It's a family business, that's how it works, right? Uh, my first job at Mountain Springs Lake, uh, I started working there when I was 11. So um, my sister was almost 18 the first time she took a crack at a restaurant in the lodge. So I was her dishwasher. She ran it, she yeah. was a charger. Yeah, so, and it was small. I mean, it was she and one other person in a very primitive kitchen. And, you know, I think there were about 10 tables out in the main dining room and we had a bar in there. So, uh, and then, uh, but then when I was outside, I was, you know, manual labor, maintenance, things like that as a kid. So I, I worked there from the time I was uh, 
11 until, um, you know, college was part-time. And after college, I came back and I was there until I was 33 years old, which is, that's when we moved from the area. I wonder what it must be like to live at a resort. Was your house like right at the resort? Oh yeah, it's right on property. So you wake up in the morning, go outside and all these strangers walking around. Well, I wouldn't call them strangers. I mean, we had a fair amount of repeat business. And what was interesting about that is, um, these people would come back same time every single year. They would reserve the same week. And um, so you really got to know them. And the interesting thing was, I mean, it was great training, honestly, for any, if you were gonna go out into the world and do something, because they would expect you, because they knew all of us, or six of us. So they would expect you to know them too. So, you know, I may see you once a year for a week, but I would, you know, say hello, know your name, you know, do all those things. So you just really kind of got to, you had to be really good at attaching a face to a name and remembering that. Plus, you know, we had a little bit of a cheat sheet, we had reservations, so we knew who was coming in every year. But you became friends with the people that came up and visited. Matter of fact, um, uh, there's a party here right now, the Ikoff family, they've been coming up since 1979. We have some people that are come, that are third generation coming up and visiting the resort. So I used to, as a, as a small child, would play with their parents on the beach. And now they're up bringing their kids. And the people that initially brought the first group up, you know, as our parents are, you know, no longer here. So it's nice. I would imagine, did you go to local schools? Did you go to the- Oh, I did. I went to Pocono Mountain High School when it was just one school. I would imagine that you had a different worldview then, you met most of your classmates, because you're meeting people from outside of the Pocono community on a regular basis. You know, in retrospect, you're absolutely right. I didn't think about it at the time because it was just normal. When you think about, um, look, the major industry in the Poconos for over 100 years was hospitality, which meant it was transient business or a lot of different people coming through and working, staying, things like that. So most of my friends were either in the resort ownership um, group or people that worked there or were in um, industries that were somewhat dependent on the hospitality business. So, you know, I would say whether you were an excavator or a plumber or an electrician, you got a fair amount of business from these businesses. And we all know that's changed. I mean, you know, water parks are the new honeymoon resorts. You know, honey, Poconos used to be the honeymoon capital of the world, right? We all knew that. But um, it was a different perspective and it and what it did for me is it made me much more curious about what else was out there So I really didn't do much about that until I got into my early 30s, but uh, in retrospect the best training I could have had uh, For what I ended up doing away from the Poconos was what happened at that resort Because it made you learn to be able to communicate with a lot of different people um, and it gave you a broader perspective than what some may have had that didn't have the opportunity to speak to people that weren't all from here. So when I graduated, I graduated from Pocono Mountain High School in 1981. Uh, it was 282 kids in my graduating class. My brother graduated in 1972, it was 135. So that speaks to the growth rate in the Poconos. And then post that, it's, it exploded. Matter of fact, um, <clears throat> just to give you perspective on how different it is, uh, like, Think back to when I was a small boy playing minor league or little league baseball. In order for us to have a league in the Poconos in, for a minor league, which is I think you can start playing minor league baseball when you, back then when you were seven or eight years old. That was before there was Pee Wee ball. There was no, that didn't exist back then. So we're talking about beginning of the 70s. Yes. So I would have been seven years old in 1970. Um, so anyway, we would have to go up to Barrett. Pocono Pines, Blakeslee, places like that, Tannersville, just to find enough teams to put together a relatively short season. Today, there's well over a dozen teams in Readers alone. Wow. And when I lived in Readers as a child, there were 400 people. I think there, I know there's thousands there out now. I don't know how many thousands of people there, but it's a different place, not worse, just different. Um, and um, so it does, it still feels, the way I would describe it is, you know, we left in 1997, came back last year. It looks similar. Trees are bigger, a lot more buildings, um, a lot more people, but the old Poconos are still out there. Right. And you don't have to go too far off the beaten path to find it. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that before. 
Yeah. Usually people talk about the differences. They focus on the differences. Everywhere's different. Yeah. Everywhere we've ever lived. So we lived in the Midwest, we have lived in North Carolina, we've lived in New York City. Everywhere that I've gone, people talk about how much where they are change, have changed. So while it's true, it's changed here. It's changed everywhere. Um, uh, let's see what, what was I in you know in the early twenties. I for various reasons I had to, I was looking this up, but um, in the early twenties, the United States had hundred million people. We have three hundred and thirty or three hundred forty million people here now. So everywhere's changed. Yeah. In some parts of the country, it's emptied out. Some parts of the country, it's gotten more populated. And we're one of those places that's gotten more populated. Well, if you don't mind, let's get back to when you were a kid at the resort. You, you had three siblings. Did they all work in the resort? And how old were they? Were they older than you? Except I know your sister. Yeah, I was, the, I was the low man on totem pole. So, oh, so um, yeah, so um, I, I'm i Bill. Uh, my sister Robin is six years older than me. She runs the event space at the resort, Robin Reader. Our brother Jack Jr. is a state representative here in Pennsylvania now. He is 68 now, I think. And our sister Jill passed away a couple years ago. Uh, she was born in 1952. Um, so there were four siblings and then my parents, of course. And everybody worked at the resort. Everybody worked at the it was resort. It a family thing. And how, what about when you come, become aware of what's going on around you, were there lots of non-family members working at the resort? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't a big place. So when I think about that, we had a couple, three people working on our maintenance team. Uh, we had a couple of housekeeping crews, but it was all people that were local and, you know, some of them lived right on our street. Mountain Springs Drive. Some of them were writing readers, but I think the furthest away any employee I can remember ever coming from was all the way in East Strasburg. Hmm. Yeah, and that was Bob Schoonover. He was a great guy. Yeah. So then let's get back to your life. You you grow up, you go to Pocono Mountain. Uh, after college, you stayed at the resort? I did. So I went to Lycoming College out in Williamsport, graduated in 85, and I came back uh, to Mountain Springs Lake, and I worked there full-time until 1997, so from 18, 1985, the one brief I worked out in Washington, D.C. for about six months in 1986. But other than that, I was at the resort, and uh, yeah, I married my wife, Kelly, uh, and we lived on, on the resort property. And um, you know, you were mentioning, what's it, what, what is it like to live on a resort earlier? Um, and you're, there's, the, way I would the way I would explain it to people is, it's kind of a slow burn, and what I mean by that is either A, there's people there, so you're making sure that people are enjoying themselves while they're there, or B, when they're not there, you're fixing things that you know maybe got broken or whatever the case may be, maintenance, general maintenance around the property, so there's always something to do. Uh, to illustrate what I mean by that, you just never really, you didn't have to leave much, and especially when you have small children like Kelly and I did at the time, I remember one time uh, somebody asking me, you know, how often do you leave the property? And I just, I kind of stepped back and thought about it. I had not left the property in nine days. Wow. So there's just always something to do. And it's kind of 24 seven because, you know, as you can imagine, uh, you don't hear about a clogged toilet when people aren't there. And it usually doesn't happen during regular business hours. So it might be nine, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And you gotta go fix it, right? You're, you're it. So there's just always something to do. So why did you leave? Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna relate it back to something that we were discussing a few minutes ago. Because of the way I grew up and because I met people from other places and I remember watching people that were executives of companies um, and um, it's kind of interesting. So this tells you how much things have changed. We didn't have telephones in the cottages. Matter of fact, we never did. So a transition from no phones, basically a phone booth up by the office if people want to use it. And that's kind of why people came there. They wanted to get away. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to everybody has cell phones, Wi-Fi, all that stuff. So now we have high-speed Wi-Fi and everything like that. Anyway, the reason I'm bringing it up is I used to see these people that I knew were executives up in that phone booth on conference. I didn't know what a conference call was at the time, but they'd be on the phone for two, three hours at a time standing in the phone booth. I was like, what are they doing? You know, I would start to, I would just start to ask them about what they did. And we had a lot of different people that, that came up. We had a um, gentleman, Clyde Schaefer, who was the CEO of Briar's Ice Cream for 40 years. We had a guy named Roy Black, who was the C, he was the chairman of the board for a company called Cobman Instruments, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson. Um, and various other people that were, that I would see and I would like ask them about what they did. And they would, you know, explain it to a, 
boy or a young man, and I was just eternally curious about it. And um, what that did was it caused me to wonder whether or not I could do that. And um, I had a, my wife uh, was very good friends with my cousin. Her husband was in the asset management business at the time, and it was a kind of a hidden, kind of an invisible job. It's called wholesaling, and they're the people that uh, represent the asset management firms to the advisors out in the advisor community. So think of it, it's kind of like pharmaceutical sales. The pharmaceutical rep talks to the doctors. We talk to advisors. We don't necessarily talk to, wouldn't talk to the end investors very often unless we're doing an educational workshop. And um, his firm was hiring. They had a couple of positions out there. And uh, the position that was open, that was offered to me was in St. Louis, Missouri. So I had a decision to make. So in 1997, we uh, parachute dropped into St. Louis, didn't know anybody west of Cincinnati, and that's how it started. Wow. And how often did you come back and visit? I was back here a couple, three times a year, come back to see our parents and things like that, holidays, because as you know, when you're, when you're married, you spend, what we've done is we decided we spend one holiday with one family, one with the other. What was nice though, when we still lived here is, um, our uh, my wife's family would come in for Thanksgiving every year, so we got to spend Thanksgiving here, both families, and then we'd go out to Ohio where her parents were for Christmas. But we would come back a couple, three times a day, usually around the holidays, and my wife would bring the kids back for summer for a couple, three weeks. I was still working at the time, so I'd sneak back on the weekends because the role I had was a flying role instead of a driving role at that point. And what, you just came back a couple years ago, you said? I just came back June of last year. June of last year? Yeah, so I retired from uh, what I was doing in, um, when was that? Uh, end of 2020, and uh, sat on the couch for three or four months, and I was like, this, I'm not ready to do this yet. So uh, what was happening was things were reopening from COVID. My sister Robin was running both the resort, the event space had closed because you couldn't do events at that time. So the weddings were starting to crank up again, and you know, I saw and she saw that she needed it, uh, someone to step in on the resort side, so that's that's what I do. So you're back at work now. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of resorts in the Poconos have not done well over the last 50 years or whatever. To what do you attribute the continued success of your place? Um, you're right, by the way. And uh, like it or not, resorts that are the way we are are somewhat of a dinosaur. And what I mean by that is it's quiet. There aren't a lot of activities. There are housekeeping units. You don't have a lot of people that cook anymore. So we have to go find those people or figure out how to relate to those people. So, you know, over the years, what we've tried to do is, you know, maintain a, you know, a marketing presence, depending on what the mediums are. So today the medium is largely electronic, it's online. So, which also means that your competition is not just here in the Poconos, not just the water parks and things like that, or the ski areas that used to send us business, but now they have their own hotels. So they don't, so your competition is global. And um, so what we have tried to do is stay ahead of that online with how we think about searches, you know, search engine optimization, digital marketing strategy and things like that. Matter of fact, we're just about to launch a new website for Mountain Springs Lake. It's gonna launch next Monday. So just staying ahead of that and also thinking about, you know, email versus, you know, we're not writing letters to people anymore as my, our mom and dad used to do, but just, Maintaining focus on um, on the type of people that like a place like ours, and the other thing that I'll you know must say help. I mean, the pandemic, like it or not, you know, there's silver linings on every cloud, and COVID helped people rediscover the Poconos. I mean, there are you know, we saw a resurgence, and I know a lot of places did in what happened, and you know. Even though kids may be really interested in looking at the screens on their phones or their iPads or whatever today, we found a new group of people that want to come up and spend time outside and doing things quietly. And so it's there are still people like that. I mean, we're you know two hours from tens of millions of people here, and when you have tens of millions of people, some of them are going to find what they're looking for in a place like ours. What do you see is future of your place? Do you see continued growth? Um, yeah, I mean, you have to, at the very minimum, maintain, but you also continue to grow. And, you know, the other thing is, too, what we're talking about is you have to evolve. Um, 
you know, can we just keep it the way it's always been? Mm, probably not. Um, do you have to think about ways to actively involve folks? Yes, but in a way that doesn't um, uh, erode the integrity of what people come there for. So you don't want to alienate your current guests by starting to do different things. So I would say it's always going to be pretty quiet, but there's going to be other things you may be able to do there than what they're, just like it's different from what it was 20, 30 years ago, it'll be different 20, 30 years from now. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure I won't be running it by then, or at least another Raider. Um, all right, well, we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, I have know? a question, I do. Um, so you, growing up and you said that it was a, a week year round, did your family ever take personal vacation? Great question. Uh, Absolutely true story. My father did not take a vacation for 25 years. So the way I describe it to folks is, you know, running a resort is no vacation because basically you're taking care of people when they're visiting and then when they're not there, you're fixing what they broke. So my dad was just on it. And, you know, we didn't have an answering service or a front desk person or anything like that. We were it. So if you weren't there to pick up the phone at night, and this is, you know, I'm sure you all were, maybe, maybe, maybe are too young to remember, I remember when there was no such thing as an answering machine. So phone rang, if you picked it up, great. There was no call or ID. So either you got to the phone quickly or you missed the call. Did you have a party line back then when you were a kid? I remember very, very, in my very early childhood, having a party line at home, not for, our, not for the resort. Right. Uh, but that was gone probably by the time I was five years old. But I do remember a Monroe County phone book that my parents had from probably around when I was born, maybe a little bit before that. And the book was about that big and it was that thick mm -hmm. and it included the yellow pages. Yeah. So to give you an idea of how things have changed, it's changed a lot. What, what other changes have you seen since moving away and coming back? Um, in the Poconos in general. Right. I would say there's a couple of things that really I see a massive change. And this has always happened. So it's just part of progress and time and things like that. There have been a, there's been a massive turnover on the types of businesses that are here and the businesses that were foundational to the area. So whether it was a the Beaver House restaurant in Stroudsburg, which would serve on New Year's Eve over a thousand meals in one night, that's gone. It's a Walgreens. Uh, many of the resorts that we use, Mountain House, whatever the case may be, they are gone. That's completely changed. Many of the old golf courses are gone. So that to me is a big change. I started driving around last year as we were thinking about what that next phase is for us and saying, okay, I mentioned we were kind of a dinosaur. Well, guess what? Either we have to evolve with what's happening or we could easily end up going the same way as those other places. You can't do that. The other thing that I see is the type of employment that's available here is different, very different than what it was. It used to be hospitality was a dominant industry. It's still a big deal. Camelback has over 1,200 employees. Um, but there's a lot of other types of businesses here that were not here. Warehousing, trucking, things like that. You know, it's just those types of roles weren't necessarily available back then. Now we're seeing a significant influx of that type of business. And I'd say better, um, not better, but, more, but just different types of jobs that may have a different type of pay scale. So what it does is it always makes you have to think about how you're gonna stay ahead of whatever the competition is, whether it's employment at a warehouse versus employment at a resort or maintaining the integrity of what you have versus what's happening out there in other parts of the Poconos. Mm. So that would say those are the big two big changes for me. Traffic, um, that's a big difference. Um, demographics here have changed a lot. Um, but, you know, it's still a vibrant community. And um, the demographics of the world have changed a lot. The demographics of our country has changed a lot. And the fact that we have the opportunity to reflect that and um, and and engage. The funny thing is this, people are still people. If people wanna get away with their kids and go somewhere quiet, 
we're it. So if they want activity, go to a water park, go to a ski area, it's all there for you. But, you know, little kids, it's I, one of my favorite things at the resort is to watch families and see how their kid, you know, people are really enjoying just spending time together. Little kids are little kids, man. They just wanna, you know, play on the beach, yeah. splash around in the water, catch a fish. That's it. Yeah. It's just people. Wow. Well, this has been a fascinating interview. Are there any questions we should have asked you? Anything we should have touched on that you were hoping to touch on? I, I do have one more, if you don't mind. No, no, great. Um, so the cabins themselves, I'd like to hear a little bit more about them. Is there kitchens in there? Or, what, or do they eat? Because you said there was a small restaurant. Is, were meals included? So funny, no, they How does we, that work? we never did, have meals included. They're housekeeping cottages. So it's like renting a two or three bedroom home or an apartment with a kitchen or kitchenette in it. Um, we do have some suites now that do not have full kitchens. They have, you know, maybe a microwave, whatever the case may be, but those are luxury suites. It's more like a high-end hotel room. But yeah, absolutely. It's like going and renting a house somewhere for a, for a week or a couple days, whatever the case may be, except it's kind of your own private preserve because we have about 320 acres now and uh, it's 39 units. Well, back when you were growing up. There were kitchen. There were kitchens. Still, yeah, there. they were always built with kitchens. Okay. So they're, yeah, log cabins or cottages. Um, yeah, always built with kitchens. Before we started today, you showed us the the prices for a week versus. Can you talk about that? For sure. So I brought along a, uh, and I'll just put it up in front of you because this is just how splashy we were back in the day. I've got a black and white brochure. This is our rate sheet, is what we used to call it. And what people would do is they would um, open this up, and you would see. You know, they all, we had 23 units back then. And, uh, you know, if they wanted to rent, they would fill this out, tell you what they wanted to do, and they would send this in to, to the resort. And there were policies and things stated, but one of the units that I was talking about before the interview started was unit number three. It's our first unit built in 1954. Uh, that unit um, in high season now on weekends goes for between five and $600 a night. And, um, when I opened this rate sheet, when I found it, when you know, looking some things up in anticipation of this interview, number three in 1971 per week in the summer was $225. So it gives you an idea of what inflation. So that's 3500 if I'm doing the math correct. Yeah, it's a different ball game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, that's just the world we do, do most people come for a single night or do they always come for a week? So two night minimums on the cottages, anything above a one bedroom. And, um, and uh, but like we have people that come into the suites one night at a time, but the cottages are two night minimums. And most of the, our, our average stay is about three nights. And the other thing that has changed, I will mention is this, lead time has dropped dramatically. So we lead would know the lead time between the time between people makers reservation and the time they arrive. Oh, okay. So when I was a child, things that came in like the rate sheet that I just showed you, we would know at the end of this, your stay in July that you were gonna come back next year. And we would take your first deposit in November. That's how it works. So our summer was pretty much full, um, you know, for the next year. Mm -hmm. um, today, uh, I was just looking at lead times, um, uh, average lead time the other day. Our average lead time now is 42 days. So the internet changed the world. We all know that. Yeah. Um, but what happens is this, if that's the average lead time, the curve is you see, you know, when you're further out, it's kind of like a slow rise. And then about literally a week before it just goes. Yeah. And so I looked at our online reservations between 5 p.m. and midnight last night, which was August 4th, nine. I looked at it during the day there have been two during the day. So people rent at night, they look online, uh, they're comparing prices, uh, and I could go deep on that too, but it's not relevant to this, but. Here's a question that might not be relevant either, but if I book a hotel room somewhere and I go online often, I don't get the hotel's website, I get a booking agency's website. Do you guys deal with that? Do, they're called OTAs or online travel agents. That's the Airbnbs, VRBOs, Expedias of the world, right? So we do deal with that and uh, we have, you have to manage that because 
when you rent through on, on the business side, you're paying a commission to those organizations. So you have to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a situation where people can get those cottages or your rental units for less than what you have on your own website. So you manage that. And the other thing that's changed is, um, you know, how many times when you try to book a flight, you know, you look at it today, you're shopping and it's, you know, a dollar. You look at it tomorrow, it's a dollar and 20 cents. You look at it the next day, it's, you know, 99 cents. So, I mean, it's just, it moves around. We also leverage price optimization to make sure we're competitive versus what's happening in the industry. So it's just a much more complex. Who does that? Does a computer do that? Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's, it's computer, you know, you're buying, you're buying into a program that, that handles that type of thing and it automatically adjusts your rates based on, you know, several variables. Uh -huh. uh, did, did you, in the early days, have people that would come for the entire season? That would, I'm sorry? Come for the entire summer. The longest I ever remember anybody staying would be about a month. Yeah. Did you give them a special prize if they stayed longer like that? I would have to ask my dad, but I can't anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure he made an adjustment of some kind. I don't know what that adjustment was. All right, great. Well, do you have any more questions? Mm -hmm. That was fascinating. Well, thanks very much, Bill. Do you have, is there anything else that we should have talked about? You know, I really can't think of anything. Um, uh, I'll just say one last thing about this area. What, when I, what I didn't realize before I left is when you leave a place that you grew up, there's two things I think you take away from those places, unless it's a really not a good place. This this is a good place. Number one, you're, you see beauty in nature and all different types of nature, but my baseline for what I think is beautiful in nature was set by where I grew up. So when I would find other places around the country that looked kind of like this area, I'd be like, wow, it's really beautiful. And my wife would say, you know why you say that? It's because it looks like where you grew up. And he was right. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing is this, it, I'm going to go back to a little part of the discussion we had. The Poconos has changed. It's still a beautiful place. Yeah. And there's still a lot of neat things you can see. Don't ignore the back roads. Don't ignore the, cause you're going to see a lot of great things and beautiful areas that people that are driving down the highway completely miss. That's right. Well, that sounds like a good note on which to end. Well, thanks very much, Bill. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay.